it's not necessarily just whether someone comes or doesn't come from a particular company or a particular sector. Um, it's, it's who they are um, and what they've represented and, and what's happened um, in their purview. You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome, friends. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. Today is the 2nd of February, 2017, and today we're going to be talking once again to Nomi Prinz, who you will remember from our previous conversation uh, on GRTV, where we were talking about the Federal Reserve and the bold, the brave new world that it's moving into in this era. She's, of course, at NomiPrinz.com, where you can find out about many of her books, both historical fiction and nonfiction, including, of course, All the President's Bankers, a very, very deep detailed history of the last century or so of relationships between presidents and bankers. And lo and behold, well, we have a story developing right now of just such a relationship. Um, this story was originally posted to TomDispatch.com, but it's been posted all over the web. Naked Capitalism, uh, Common Dreams, it's uh, up on Zero Hedge under the title Nomi Prince on the Goldmanization of President Trump, in which she goes into the ties between the Trump administration and Goldman Sachs. It is a pleasure and an honor to have you on the program again, Nomi. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so very much, James. Well, it's great to have your input on this topic, not only because you have written one of the most exhaustive and exhaustively documented books on the relationships between presidents and bankers of the past century, but of course you have your own experience with Goldman Sachs directly. So that will obviously be informative as we proceed with this conversation. But in order to understand, I think, what's happening now, we do have to understand a little bit of the history. Uh, I think people have heard Goldman Sachs referred to as government Sachs because of its revolving door. But how did it get to where it was? And in your book, on uh, All the President's Bankers, you note uh, on page 202 of my edition, uh, Goldman did not approach its zenith of influence in the scheme of alliances between key bankers and presidents until the 1980s, when the firm lobbied behind the scenes for laxer commodities trading rules, and in the 1990s and beyond, when it stretched into the heights of political financial influence in the Treasury Secretary post on both sides of the aisle through Democrat Robert Rubin and Republican Harry Paulson. Uh, Henry Paulson, sorry. Revisionist history makes it seem as if the firm was always as influential as it came to be, but really Sidney Weinberg, the former chairman, was an anomaly for decades, a true operator and connector. It wasn't until Lyndon Johnson's Treasury Secretary, Henry Fowler, who was a friend of Weinberg's, left Washington to go to Goldman Sachs that this new chain of power relationships between the firm and D.C. truly began. So tell us a little bit about that sort of prehistory, if you will, of, Goldman, of government Sachs, talking about the Weinberg era and how it became the firm that it is. Yeah, well, um, Goldman Sachs, of course, was an investment bank um, before Sidney Weinberg came to take it over. And he, um, in the 1920s, when um, a lot of uh, things called trusts, which are really the past version of what we, I think, can today call um, securitization vehicles or, or CDOs or all the sorts of uh, names that are associated with packing a level of either loans or securities or bonds or something inside um, a less transparent other financial instrument. And in, and in the 20s, those were trusts. And um, they basically packed into them different stocks, different bonds, different associations with private companies um, into sort of one vehicle or, or one trust. Um, and actually, Goldman Sachs was one of the companies that was involved in creating these trusts and selling them um, to investors at the time. And in the 20s, of course, there was very lax um, regulation in general um, with respect to banking, but in particular with respect to, you know, new sorts of, of instruments like these. Um, and so there, there really was no oversight. So, so trust could be developed. The, uh, stock market was was having um, you know an excellent time uh, there was money to invest it was post world war 1 so america itself was on an up um, swing relative to um, the decimation that had just happened in Europe and that was being rebuilt in Europe. So there was money coming in from overseas and money from the country itself. And, and lots was going into the market. And these trusts were a way to sort of leverage um, that. And Goldman Sachs was one of the companies involved. Um, however, by the time we uh, had all that fun and got to 1929 and the crash of the stock market and um, the crash of uh, these trusts, which were sort of leveraged bets on, on stocks and other types of, of um, 
ventures, um, a lot of companies looked really bad <laughs> to to investors um, and also in terms of their own evaluations. Uh, Weinberg was running Goldman Sachs at the time, which was one of the many companies um, whose trusts imploded um, and against whom um, there were uh, potential lawsuits. There was a lot of strife. There, there was a lot of negative um, uh, perception um, because people lost a lot of money um, and you know, these, these sort of ideas that, you know, these were crooks on Wall Street and all that sort of thing um, that had basically leaked, um, basically bled people of, of this money. Um, so what Weinberg was doing um, was trying to find a way and he was a very, um, he was a public minded person, but he was a banker and he was an opportunist and he had a lot of friends and business connections throughout um, having created these trusts on Wall Street and so forth. Um, and he was also um getting closer and close to FDR, um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was the governor of New York at the time. Um, this was all going down and was running for president in 1932 when Herbert Hoover was um, obviously not going to be reelected president, given that the crash and the subsequent depression had happened under his watch. Um, and FDR was rising um, in the Democratic Party. Uh, he was well known anyway. Um, he had run before as a, as a VP candidate, didn't, didn't make it, um, and now was his chance. And Sidney Weinberg sort of saw that opportunity to both resurrect Goldman, um, his own reputation, um, and the sort of role as a financial political operator. So he wound up helping FDR um, raise money for his presidential um, bid. And as it turned out, of course, FDR won. Um, and he remembered his friends. He remembered, as presidents do, the people that made money for them going into running for that office. Um, and he gave um, Weinberg a, a lot of roles as sort of a policy advisor. Um, we call it today policy advisor, basically advisory roles. So they weren't officially appointed roles. They were just um, different types of business council type advisory roles, you know, the connection between the business community um, and the political community. Um, and so Weinberg had that under FDR for the, the several, uh, three terms, three and a half terms. So um, there, was, there was a fourth term, a piece, a piece of fourth term that, that FDR had been in, um, as well as um, then after FDR. So, so through um, President Truman, through Eisenhower, um, through uh, through um, JFK, through um, LBJ, through Nixon, um, and so he basically was was involved behind the scenes, um, and that that's how that happened. Um, but but the so the, the company grew in that manner, um, sort of with him at the forefront of that connection between Wall Street and and Washington, um, and then the second theme of that um, was what happened to, to some extent under LBJ um, with Fowler, as you mentioned, but, but to a bigger extent um, into really the 90s um, and into Bill Clinton's um, administration. And that's kind of Goldman part two um, in terms of the history of the relationships and the influence that, that Goldman has had as, as a bank on the presidency and on domestic and foreign policy that's related to the presidency um, and also regulations, deregulations and so forth in the financial system, in the commodity system, which relates to the energy um, sector and, and all sorts of other sectors that basically finance themselves and, and are active in the derivatives market. Well, as um, people who read your books may or may not know, your own personal biography coincides with uh, Goldman Sachs. Tell us about your time at the firm. So right after um, Robert Rubin, actually, who, who was a, a co-CEO of Goldman Sachs and became the Treasury Secretary under Bill Clinton, having done basically what Weinberg did, which was help Clinton raise money um, to run for his presidency um, before he became president. And then he was subsequently made head of the National um, Economic Council, which uh, was created by Clinton for Rubin, and then he became Treasury Secretary. Um, around that time, I was actually working at Bear Stearns in London um, in the 90s, um, and there was a lot of um, uh, talk of deregulating the large banks in the United States to actually compete with the European banks, so to have investment banks and commercial banks connect and repeal um, the Glass-Steagall Act, which FDR had passed in 1933 to separate investment from commercial banking. Um, and there was a lot of push from the investment banking community to um, have that be repealed um, and from the commercial banking um, community for, for different reasons. And commercial banking uh, world first, even though in general deregulation was something that both sides wanted. And I was, um, I was working in, in Europe, as I said at the time. I, I moved over to uh, New York from London to actually work at Goldman Sachs as a managing director in um, 
their research area. Um, so I basically ran two areas. One was um, uh, the sort of quantitative credit analytics, which were part of what field credit derivatives um, and a lot of the, the CDOs and other types of uh, securities that became at the um, sort of vortex of the subprime crisis and beyond, um, as well as um, another area that worked with um, restructuring um, uh, sort of corporate insurance company, financial company um, balance sheets um, in terms of restructuring loans and um, rejiggering them into other securities. So it's a very much the same types of engineering um, that were at the crux of this crisis and in really other crises in, in different capacities. Um, so that was my that was my stint at Goldman Sachs <clears throat> from 2000, which is right after Glass Steagall was repealed um, and the firm actually went public as well um, before I got there in '99. And um, and then I was there for a couple of years, um, saw what was going on, uh, quit in 2002, um, so two years after I, I joined, um, and then uh, wrote um, a bunch of books, including Other People's Money, which was my first book, which um, came out in 2004 and talked a lot about what it was like. Um, in those years at Goldman in that particular relationship between influencing um, the presidency from inside an institution um, and just just what it was like within the institution as that was happening and also um, warning of how unregulated securities and derivatives um, in how they were being traded and constructed and used and the lack of transparency and regulation of them would basically cause a financial crisis. And in particular, after the repeal of Glass-Steagall um, in 1999, which allowed um, first big supermarket banks to exist um, with commercial banking and investment banking combined um, so that deposits could be used as um, basically collateral for, for bets, um, for bigger bets and, and more esoteric securities. Um, but what that also did was it caused banks like Goldman Sachs um, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, which those two no longer exist. I, I did work at both of those as well. Um, but but caused them to push the government to allow them to leverage or or to bet more on the margin against um, assets they did hold on their books. Um, so in other words, to borrow more against what they had um, than they should have been able to do, um, and, uh, and and encourage and push the SEC, the Securities Exchange Commission, to allow them to do this. And one of the people that pushed this was Hank Paulson, who, when I was at Goldman Sachs, was the CEO and chairman of Goldman Sachs. And then um, a little bit after I left, but in 2004, he was one of the key people um, trying to convince the SEC and, and um, you know um, regulators in Washington to allow this leverage internally for these investment banks, the ones that chose not to um, merge with a big commercial bank as J.P. Morgan did with Chase, um, but to stay alone and yet have the same um, sort of competitive power, the same ability to make big bets um, that the commercial supermarket banks now could do because they had a bigger balance sheets with all these people's deposits and loans on them. Um, and then, of course, two years after uh, Hank Paulson did that, he became the Treasury Secretary for George W. Bush in um, the run-up to what became the financial crisis in 2007-2008, um, a, a lot of which was caused by by his pushing leverage into investment banking and investment banking taking advantage of that change in rule. Um, and prior to that, Robert Rubin, having been one of the key pushers of repealing Glass-Steagall, which caused the banking sector to become um, these investment banks who wanted to leverage themselves more and these commercial banks that owned investment banks who could do it naturally um, after the repeal in 1999 of Glass-Steagall. So um, the two of them had a had a large impact um, on what we know to be the financial system today. Um, and I basically, I mean, I, I worked at Goldman when, when Hank Paulson was the CEO and chairman and after after Robert Rubin, years after Robert Rubin had left to, to be a part of uh, the Clinton administration as Treasury Secretary. Well, um... I think there's a couple of different ways in which this revolving door functions. And one I think is very overt and the public understands and sees that. And one is more, if not covert, at least not as well understood because it's less difficult to see. And 
The one that I think is overt is, as you gesture to, for example, with Weinberg and FDR, when a banker helps to fund a politician's campaign, uh, obviously they're going to expect certain favors in return. And I think the public understands that. So we can see, for example, uh, Barack Obama, one of his prime top donors back in 2008 was Goldman Sachs. So um, people understand how that relationship functions. But the the less publicized uh, relationship uh, is the one that I think you go into such great detail here in all the president's bankers talking about the um, uh, not just the personal indebtedness of a given president to the banks, but the uh, the sense that the president has to find a way to work with the banks so that the financial system itself can continue to function. So there is some quid pro quo that goes on and each president ha- uh, comes to his own different relationship. And for example, you could point to um, Teddy Roosevelt and, and uh, J.P. Morgan and uh, Teddy Roosevelt felt that J.P. Morgan was the person who could save the economy in the crash of uh, 1907, the panic of 1907. And so that's the kind of yeah, a relationship that uh, that he tried to foster. And uh, going forward, we can see that with every president. And as I say, every president has their own particular relationship that they come to with the bankers, sometimes closer, sometimes more distant. Now, as we enter the Trump era, I think people may be too distracted on the idea, oh, Trump doesn't need the banker's money, therefore he's not beholden to their interests. But that's not necessarily the type of relationship that's going to be developing here. I'd like to get your thoughts on what we can tell so far about what Trump's relationship to the banking community is and what it might be as he tries to proceed with uh, his restructuring of the, the American economy. Yeah, I mean, it's very simple right now what his relationship is, because he has basically appointed a Treasury secretary who is a former partner at Goldman Sachs um, and as head of his um his economic counsel, the the former president of Goldman Sachs, Gary Cohn, um, who actually was my boss's boss when I was at, at Goldman Sachs. He was one of the uh, managing partners at the time of um, the FIC division, um, fixed income, currency, and commodities, so the area that traded, the area that took risk. Um, and through that, he, he ultimately um, moved more up the firm into the president and number two spot at Goldman Sachs. Um, so it's very clear what Trump's current relationship is with Goldman Sachs, which is that he has the number two guy at Goldman Sachs um, coming in as, as a major policy advisor for both domestic and foreign policy um, in the same slot that originally Bill Clinton created for Robert Rubin um, when he first came to Washington, from which Robert Rubin uh, quickly became the Treasury Secretary, so it, it could be seen as the number two spot in 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 the in the Treasury Department, even though it's not an official Assistant Treasury Secretary position. Um, but that is how it worked under Clinton. So that so that there's 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 Gary Cohn, and there's of course Steve Mnuchin, who um, wasn't as high at Goldman Sachs. He, he he was a partner. His father was a partner there. I mean, he, he has that that history, that connection. Um, but more importantly, he has the mentality. Of Goldman Sachs because after he left, and he actually left Goldman Sachs the same year I did, which was 2002. Um, he made a whole lot more money than I did. <laughs> I became a journalist. Um, um, I chose a very different path and that I'm quite comfortable with. Um, and he chose the path of uh, becoming a hedge fund operator and, and other things. And, and in the capacity of, 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 of running a hedge or private equity fund, Dune Capital, um, which he created a little after he left Goldman Sachs with two other former Goldman Sachs partners. Um, he wound up creating a consortium or gathering a consortium of hedge fund uh, runners and sort of other other wealthy individuals to to purchase IndyMac, which was a failed uh, bank in Pasadena, California, not too far away from where I live now, um, and uh, and basically buy it on the cheap from the FDIC, who had sort of taken it over as it was it was failing. It had it had when when it, it was much more of a sort of community style type bank, so it was suffering from. Um, people who couldn't necessarily pay their mortgages during during the, um, the subprime and mortgage crisis, but but who could have had them worked out? Um, and some did, but many didn't. And, and thousands that could have worked out their mortgages um, under the purchase of Steve Mnuchin and his um, team were forced out of their homes. And um, even in uh, in questioning um, in front of um, his hearings um, for his confirmation hearings. Um, yeah, he, he positioned himself as being a hero for having taken over this bank um, because it would have been far worse. He said for these people had, had he sort of not come to the rescue with all these sort of millionaires and, 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 and billionaires in, in terms of their individual wealth or, or their firm wealth. Um, and so therefore he was a help to them. Um, 
to my knowledge, none of these people have thanked him that, that he says he helped. So I don't know, <laughs> but I do know that, that many people, um, and, and, and groups, um, are involved in, in, in legal, um, battles with him and with, um, the company that he was involved in that, that, that did take over that bank and did, um, get involved in forcing people out of their homes and used, um, government money to, to fund that, that process, um, as well. And those are some of the questions he was, um, asked and, and sort of tried to answer in, in his hearing. Um, and uh, some of the things that he did after having left Goldman. And, and so so the two of them, um, both of them represent um, this mentality of risk-taking um, that both connects into, into Trump. So now they are, they are his bankers. So if I were to write another chapter, which I will probably have to do at some time um, in, in some revised version of all the president's bankers and follow Trump as the president after Obama and his relationships with, with his bankers. His bankers are Steve Mnuchin and, and Gary Cohn. And, and both of them, um, not simply having come from Goldman, and, and of course Gary had a more senior position um, at Goldman and, and Mnuchin had probably a more lucrative position outside, although they both, they're both incredibly wealthy and, and have done well from that, that respect. Um, their mentality of risk taking is 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 not dissimilar from from Trump's. Their their concept of of regulation or deregulation in the financial sector um, is not different from Trump's. Not different from Rubin's. So the mentality is something that that carries through, and that's what I really tried to talk about in in the piece that you refer to um, on, on on Goldmanizing Trump. It's 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 really. Um, the the bankers that each president um, connects with, um, and many have been from Goldman, but but even from other firms, when whether they're policy advisors or appointed positions, um, you know, tend to have a like-minded approach to the financial system, to to the banking system, sector, to regulation, um, to transparency, to you know, accumulation at the top versus distribution throughout, and and that sort of thing. And so um, that's what these two people represent. Um, to Trump and 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 actually also reflect um, Trump, who is a deal maker. Um, you know, it's it's interesting because this year, well, actually for the last six years running, Goldman Sachs has been the top um, M and A merger and acquisition advisor in the world. This is now the sixth year running. So so in the world, not just of finance, but the world of like the world <laughs> related to finance, they are the deal maker. Um, so 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 you know, Gary was was involved in in um, in that senior position at that firm throughout all those years. So it's, it's, it's that mentality that, that goes into DC. And, and, and in my opinion, um, we have problems as a global economy, um, as a citizen's economy, when in particular, the, the American government um, is creating policies that, that deregulate or destabilize that financial system. It doesn't have good outcomes. Um, for the rest of the economy. Well, I think I, I don't give the, uh, the the question credence when people say, well, who would you expect him to appoint to head of the SEC or head of the Treasury or these important financial posts? It's not going to be a carpenter or a mailman or something, a dog catcher. Of course, it's going to be people with history and finance. It's going to be bankers. Uh, I think that is a bit of a trite question. But the underlying point, I think, is an apt one, which is, could this system function in any other way? Could it function uh, to have these positions of such centralized control and power uh, that have a huge influence on financial matters and on the industry without having some sort of relationship with the bankers themselves? And uh, I don't think... I don't myself, and you've documented a century now, at least, of of this type of relationship um, between presidents and bankers. Could it be any other way? Well, I mean, there, there, there's certainly um, an element of, of wanting someone running a Treasury Department to have some idea of, of finance and, and business and, you know, perhaps law and not sort of learn on the fly. That, that's, that, that's completely valid. Um, and yes, I mean, a lot of people do say, well, who, who do you expect? You know, in H -H or Hillary Clinton ran sort of on this idea when she was asked about the speeches she gave and, and just things she'd said about people on Wall Street that, that for regulatory positions, the people that know it should be the people um, in these positions. But, you know, it's 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 kind of like saying, and I don't know, I'm not really good at sports analogies, so you may have to help me out with this, James, but it'd be, it'd be like taking 
say an outstanding athlete that has actually been proven to be using, um, you know, steroids or something else. I don't mean someone who's been accused, right. But I mean, someone who's actually, um, you know, fundamentally, um, taken a, a, an unfair advantage, let's say over, over other athletes in a particular field or whatever, and saying, because that person's an athlete, then, then they should be the one, um, in charge of some, you know, if, if we had an athletic, you know, I don't know, uh, <laughs> secretary of, of, of sports or something in Washington, but, but, um, as opposed to someone who has equal, you know, time and knowledge of, of sports or of, or of that, you know, area, but, but hasn't had that tarring, you know what I mean? So it, it's not, it's not necessarily so much where someone comes from. It's, it's what they've done and what they represent and what they want to do from that position. Um, you know, Goldman Sachs with Gary in the number two position has copped to a lot of fines for a lot of crimes with the department of justice, the SEC, the FDIC. I mean, it, it's got a laundry list of violations, um, under his watch. Uh, Steve Mnuchin has companies that have a laundry list of violations. Um, under his involvement. So it, it's not necessarily just whether someone comes or doesn't come from a particular company or a particular sector. Um, it's, it's who they are um, and what they've represented and, and what's happened um, in their purview. Yes, exactly right. I mean, we don't even have to go for sports analogies. You could just think, I mean, would you appoint a, a convicted felon as the police commissioner or something of that sort? I mean, right. it's that, that far simpler. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, but as a Canadian, let me use this opportunity to uh, to make the analogy of Ben Johnson being ahead of the uh, International Doping Agency or something like that. But anyway, <laughs> that's the sporting analogy you were looking for. But uh, oh, yeah. uh, the point is well taken. Uh, these are people who have been involved, intimately involved in Gary Cohn's case in the number two position slated to be a potential successor for, uh, for blank fine at the head of Goldman Sachs, a firm that has been involved in, 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 in genuine violations that, uh, that have taken place. And yet now is going to be, uh, in an extreme position of power. It is, uh, it, it really does create, uh, a sense of hopelessness in a lot of people who have seen this happen time and time and time again, and a lot of people who I think genuinely thought, well, Trump isn't beholden to the bankers, therefore it will be different. And it is more of the same, which leaves us wondering if it can ever change from within the political system. My answer would tend to be no, but I know other people are more optimistic. I don't know what to say about that. Well, I, I just think that right now... Um being optimistic is, is probably less realistic than, than being, <laughs> um, well, not so much pessimistic or perhaps, but just being, being highly aware, um, and highly, um, critical of, of what actually happens under these people and, and what the ramifications could be and, and will be, um, under them. I mean, I think, I think that's really the, the step in terms of, um, you know, it's it's not necessarily like an average citizen can can kick out the treasury secretary per se, but 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 it, but it's important as it was when Glass Steagall was um, was repealed to understand the ramifications of of the kind of risk that that put into the financial system, and it, it wasn't a risk that 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 was hard to determine. I mean, there was there was many people who questioned that not enough. Um, but there were certainly people who questioned what the ramifications could be. Um, they were in the minority, they were shut up, whatever. But I mean, it's, it's, I think now we have much more communication across platforms than then, you know, a lot more on social media on, on, on things like this. I mean, where, where people actually can get, um, sort of more information and, and, and form their own opinions, um, right or wrong, um, with enough information or requiring more information, um, along the way. And I just think that, um, vigilance will be um, an action in terms of of, of watching what, what what these people do in their in their positions of power. Absolutely. Well, I am looking forward to your own vigilance on that because I do value your <laughs> your take on these things. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm also looking forward to your forthcoming book, Artisans of Money, which we talked about in our previous conversation, in which I'm distracting you from the writing of. So I will uh, let you go <laughs> shortly. But perhaps we should uh, just uh, give a nod to that and the fact that uh, perhaps I mean if there's a ray of hope here. It may be that the actions of the, the Federal Reserve banking system and the banks that populate it may not be so important in the future, right? <laughs> well, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, Artisans of Money really uh, looks at that line between um, 
what the Federal Reserve and, and what it required of other central banks did in the wake of the financial crisis um, and is actually still doing um, in terms of cheap money, artisans of money, creating creating ways to basically artificially stimulate the banking system and the markets and, and what, what, again, will be the ramifications of that um, and, and how they are getting um, – I don't know if they're getting to the, to the end of their sort of bag of tricks. Some people have said they have been, but I mean, I've been doing all, I've been looking through all the documents and all this stuff, and it's amazing how creative they've, they've been very quietly um, throughout the process and, and as well as publicly um, in terms of the, the extent to which they've buoyed the markets um, and the extent to which that's created a lot of artificial um, bubbles and policies and strifes between governments and central banks and strifes between people and governments and um, has really laid the pavement for um kind of the, the chaotic world that we have right now, um, sort of the, the destabilized both financial and political world that, that we have um, and people's general disenchantment with all of that. Um, so I kind of follow that throughout the world in this book and um, we'll see what happens. <laughs> when it comes we down. certainly I mean, will. I may, be writing, yeah. I may be writing the last few pages as it's going to press, but uh, at this point I have to hand it in in a, in a four weeks. So. Wow. Well, right. Well, I will let you get back to it. I am looking forward to it. In the meantime, we'll direct people, of course, to nomiprins.com, link in the show notes as always, and you can uh, check out her other books, including all the President Bankers, which we've been talking about here. And the link to the article about Trump and Goldman will be in the show notes as well, so people can read a little bit more detail about some of these characters that are now being appointed to high positions of power in the Trump administration. Nomi Prinz, I always value your time and input. Thank you for appearing on the program. Thank you very much. The Federal Reserve, the heart of the American banking system. For over 100 years, it has operated in the shadows, controlling America's money supply in total secrecy. So all that information is available uh, in our commercial paper program. And who got the money? Hundreds and hundreds of banks. Any bank or that has uh, access to the U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve's discount. Can you tell us who they are? No. Until now. 100 years ago, in 1913, the Fed was created. Fractional reserve banking. The legal authority to do it. Takeover of monetary policy. Are conducted by the Federal Reserve Banks. They are banks. There is no other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. Century of Enslavement. The history of the Federal Reserve. Watch the documentary for free at corporatereport.com slash Federal Reserve and purchase a copy on DVD to help support the Corbett Report today.